Let me say that I'm here um, for two purposes. The first is to celebrate the 25th anniversary of what was, is, and I'm sure will be one of the most important inventions of post-war, post-wall Brandenburg, and that's the Einstein Forum. The Einstein Forum was created to do something that really was very rare, and that was to give a public <laughs> forum to conversations, conversations about comfortable and conversations about uncomfortable topics. The topic today is, in my mind, uh, an uncomfortable one. My title, which is a kind of parody of Faulkner's line in Requiem for a Nun, a line that has gotten cited over and over again in Trump's America, that the past is never dead. It's not even past. Faulkner was thinking about the Civil War and post-Reconstruction America, thinking about race, family, and truth. <clears throat> what I want to talk today about is some of the uncomfortable truths about beauty. And an aspect which interests me because it has reappeared in contemporary neurosciences. Now, the Enlightenment founds our understanding of beauty. The Enlightenment invents its Plato and Aristotle. We inherit the categories of the Enlightenment. And one of the great debates in the Enlightenment has to do precisely with the relationship between beauty, not beauty and truth, but beauty and race. You know the debate. It's become a commonplace. Is the perception of beauty universal, or is the perception of beauty cultural? On the cultural side, we can put Lessing in his Laocoon. Lessing, that great apostle of religious toleration, the nice enlightenment. Let me read you from Laocon. Everyone knows how filthy the Hottentots are and how many things they consider beautiful and elegant and sacred, which with us awaken disgust and aversion. A flattened cartilage of nose, flabby breasts hanging down to the navel, the whole body smeared with a cosmetic of goat's fat and soot gone rotten in the sun. The hair dripping with grease, arms and legs bound about with fresh entrails. Let one think of this as the object of an ardent, reverent, tender love. Let one hear this uttered in the exalted language of gravity and admiration, and then try not to laugh. That's the good guy. That's Lessing, saying, there are, of course, universals. There are universals of beauty. The universals of beauty, however, are ours. They're those of the West. They're those of Laocon, that statue which for less incorporated not only beauty, but also moral truth. His great opponent was Christoph Martin Wieland, who in Agathon proposes an anti-Platonic aesthetics, which refers much the same referent as that employed by Lessing. Here is Wieland. Imagine a meeting of many lovers as there are nations in all the directions of heaven. What is more sure that each will praise his beloved among all others, above all others? 
the European will prefer brilliant white, the Moor, the raven-like black of his beloved. The Greek will prefer the small mouth, a breast able to be covered with a cupped hand, and the pleasing regularity of a fine form. The African, a flattened nose, oily skin, and swollen lips. Does this have anything to do with the beautiful in a moral sense? I doubt it, says Villant. Now, that debate is the debate about the beautiful and the true and the moral and the values of a society and a society which both still had slavery and which, by the way, there were slaves in Prussia, but also a society which is wrestling with how it conceives of the world that it sees. Kant, we know, avoids this pitfall completely by the second edition of the Kritik der Urteilskraft. <coughs> In his discussion of the Ideale der Schönheit, Kant denies the existence of objective criteria for aesthetic judgment. There are no objective rules of taste, he writes, determined by set concepts for all judgment from this source is aesthetic, that is, the feeling of the subject and not the concept of the object is its determination. Thus Kant emphasizes the uniqueness of the perception of the black while modifying his negative evaluation of the singularity. Kant says, if in a similar manner one sought for an average man, an average head, for this head an average nose. The basis for this would be the normative idea of the beautiful in that land where this comparison took place. This normative idea is not extrapolated from proportions taken from experience, but only after it is formed is judgment possible. Now, the notion of this ideal debated within philosophy uh, is one which, in complicated ways, of course, never gets resolved. It is the debate that we have today about whether or not the infiltration of Western categories of beauty or, indeed, the usurpation of non-Western categories of the beautiful is a good thing or a bad thing. Let me say, well, the other thing that it begins to evoke is whether or not the beautiful exists at all as a unitary category. And I got interested in this because a group of neuroanatomists have recently taken the step of using fMRIs to show us how the brain processes the beautiful. It must be real, because we can see it. <laughs> of course, Kant already got rid of that problem. But one of the things that is interesting about the Enlightenment is that it gives status to the scientific argument about the psychology of the beautiful very early on, way before, way before Kant, way before Lessing way before Vilant. In 1692, William Molino um, gave us a thought experiment. Molino asked, what would a blind man see if his sight were restored? You evoke this with Amari's notion of the blind man seeing color, right? Now, this is an interesting thought experiment. Think of it as analogous to um, James I of England's query about what language would an infant speak if it never heard anyone speak a language. But we know the answer to that. James gives it, of course. It's Hebrew. <laughs> you don't believe me? That's science. And Molino asks, what, how would colors be perceived? 
Now, the institutions of the time are wrestling with this question. And they're wrestling with a kind of illusion that draws, certainly in the Enlightenment, I don't even argue today, the notion of beauty and maybe also the notion that there's a pair called beauty and ugliness into question. Francis Hutchins in 1722 um, emphasizes that the associations between blackness and darkness, darkness, the absence of light, are strong associations of ideas without any reason by mere accident sometimes. Now, the aestheticians, the philosophers, give much weight to the scientists. And of course, someone then, of course, had to do a James I experiment. William Chesilden in 1727 presents a case study of a 13-year-old boy, blind from birth, whose sight was restored through the operation for the relief of cataracts, couching for cataracts. Chesilden provides, in a sense, the scientific answer to Molino's question about what would a blind person see. And by the way, Chesilden is the first of a long number of such studies of the restoration of sight to the blind. Chesilden isn't interested in the surgery per se. He's concerned with the kind of epistemological questions that show up in Kant, in Lessing, in Wieland. He observes that while the patient had the ability to distinguish between darkness and light, after the operation, and here I'm quoting Chesilton, the faint ideas he had of them before were not sufficient for him to know them by afterwards. This is what Molino suspected. And therefore, he did not think them the same which he had before known by those names. Now, scarlet, Chesilton goes on, he thought the most beautiful of colors, and of others the most gay, were the most pleasing. And now comes the moment which interested me in Cheslinden's paper. Whereas the first time he saw a black, it gave him great uneasiness. Yet for a little time he was reconciled to the color black. But some months after, seeing by accident a Negro woman, he was struck with great horror at the sight. Now, we live in an age with this type of psychological experiment. Think about the debate recently about the so-called marshmallow experiment is oftentimes reduced to the mechanics of a kind of rote psychology. The question I have with Chesilton's paper is how the notion of blackness and darkness and fear get folded in to notions of beauty. We can see this throughout both the visual art, both of the late 18th century up certainly through the romantics, but also how we begin to elide categories the beautiful is not a category separate from the cultures that use it. The 19th century mathematician in Basel means something very different than the facial recognition expert at MIT who is every year generating the perfect facial recognition software that suddenly doesn't recognize whole sections of the population because they were not fed in to the algorithm. Beauty is not only a tangential category, it is a problematic category because it folds into itself cultural presuppositions, 
presuppositions about universality, propositions about cultural norms that reflect also the organizational structure that science superimposes on human psychology. There is no Venn diagram of beauty. There is no point where all of these categories overlap. Beauty, and here I am paraphrasing Faulkner, ain't truth. Hell, it ain't even beauty. But we act as if it must be so. I thank you very much.